I'm really excited today. We have another service going on later too. Wow, church. Wow, church. So excited, so excited, so excited. Mm, supernatural energy and renewal of mind and my body. This takes a lot. It takes a lot to get everything going. I'm so appreciative of everyone here. So appreciative. We're in our series called Hello, My Name Is. My name is what? Okay, I had to do it. Slam Shady. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, my name is Jehovah Jireh. Someone say Jehovah Jireh. Jireh. Yes, yes. I'm really excited. We're in a series going over the names of God, teaching you and learning what it is when he says, I am Jehovah Jireh. What does that mean for you and me? Because that sounds a little bit weird and crazy, but we're going to dive into it, learning about his name. Why are we in this series? Why are we in this series? Because I think it's important to know who it is that we worship, who it is that we praise, who it is that we glorify, ultimately who it is that we live for. Who is this God that we're worshiping? Who is this God that we're praising? Who is this God that we sing about up on a stage? Why do we do this? And I believe that as we learn his name, that we realize more of why and who it is that we do it for. I am the Lord. I am Jehovah. Look at this. You can put this up here. Isaiah 42. I am the Lord. That is my name, my glory. I give it to no other, nor my praise to carve idols. He is the only one worthy of our praise, and he is the Lord. He is Jehovah. He is worthy of it all. No other idol, no president is worthy of praise beyond him. No self, I'm not worthy of praise. Mm. He is the only one worthy of praise. He is the only one worthy of it all. Amen, church? I love that we sang that song. It's good. Yahweh, Jehovah, we need to know who it is that we glorify. This is the proper name of God. Y-H-W-H. They didn't include... Um, they didn't include the vowels because, first of all, there's, there's two reasons why they wouldn't include the vowels. First of all, the Hebrew language sounds very breathy. So it would, it would model a breath, Yehovah, all right? But not only that, they, they didn't want to include the vowels because his name is so sacred, they didn't want someone to mispronounce it on accident. He is worthy of praise, and he is powerful. He is the only God. He is the only God. I am the Lord your God. Look at it. It keeps going. You'll find this all over the scriptures. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Hey, we serve a God who can save us. Amen, church? He's been in the business of saving us forever and ever. Look at what he did for Israel. And look at what Jesus did on the cross. His nature is to save. Amen, church? Yeah. You shall have no other gods before me. I love that he says that, though. I am the one who saves. I'm the one who restores. I'm the one who heals. I'm the one who provides. Don't put anyone else above me. Don't do it. There is no other God. There is no other name worthy of our glory. So, Nick, why are we so fixated on the name part? Why are we so focused on the name? I was reading scripture, and I found this in Psalm chapter 9. I found this to be so powerful. Please take notes. If there's one thing that you take away from today, it's this scripture. Those who know your what? Right, everyone had their coffee. I know it's 10 a.m. Okay, good. Those who know your what? Good. Thank you. Oh, that was that's how it should be in church. Those who know your name put their trust in you. I, I often like to read scriptures backwards sometimes. We put our trust in him when we know his name. If you don't know his name, who are you trusting in? Who are you trusting in? Who are you trusting in? For you, O oh Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. When you learn his name, you seek him out, you trust him, you rely on him. There is a faith that is built up as we learn about the name. I wrote it down like this. And again, if you're taking notes, please write this down as well. When you know his name, you understand more of who he is. Therefore, you can trust with all of your life. And so today we're talking about Jehovah Jireh. Someone say Jireh. We've been singing, you are Jaira. Yeah, we've been singing that song. It's incredible. And I'm really excited to dive in what it looks like about, about the God who will provide. The God who provides. That, that is what Jehovah Jaira means. Abraham, he receives a great promise, okay? Abraham is in the Old Testament. 
and he has promised to be the father of nations, but there's a problem. He doesn't have a son. And he's like, hey, I'm pretty old, God. It's about time. You're going to make something happen right now. Me and my wife, we're old. Can this happen? And so God blesses them with a son, Isaac. Someone say Isaac. And what happened is in Genesis 22, God says, hey, Abraham, I need you to go and worship me. Sacrifice, get ready to pour it all out for me. And so he gets the wood ready, he gets everything going, and he's about to build an altar to God to, to sacrifice and to praise. And then all of a sudden God says, hey, you're going to sacrifice your only son. Could you imagine hearing those words? I'd be like, no, that's my warrant, sir. You can go and figure yourself out. Nope. That's my warrant. But Abraham was faithful, and he trusted. When you know the name, you can trust. Amen, church? And so Abraham is getting all the stuff ready for this burnt offering. And he even puts, can you imagine Isaac in this circumstance? It's like, hey, uh, Dad, where's the sheep? And he's like, we have an interesting conversation coming up, buddy. You're going to lay on this thing. And we're about to sacrifice you. I don't know, me? I'd be like, bro, you're crazy. And I'd start running. Hmm. Someone say, he provides. He does provide. All the way up until the moment where Abraham is about to begin the sacrifice, all of a sudden, he lifted up his eyes, and the Lord showed up. He looked up, and behold, there was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. God showed up and provided a way out provided a, a, a pure and wonderful sacrifice. And so Abraham went, he took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. And so this is where the name come from. Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will, someone say it, provide, provide. The Lord will provide. And so we're going to get into what it means to provide. But that's what his name is, Jehovah Jireh. That's who we're talking about. The Lord will provide. So when you read your Bible in Genesis chapter 22 and you see the Lord will provide, the actual words for that are Jehovah Yireh. That's what it is. The Lord will provide. I love that. I love that. And I've been doing this over this series where Jireh is, Nick, that's a weird word. So what does it mean? Let me know. And I've been doing a study on just kind of what these, these various words are. It is more than just provide. The other thing about old languages, there are, there are, are words that are so rich with meaning. And so I want to take a look at what Jira means today. Guys, are you all with me today? Everyone feeling good? Everyone feeling good? Good, 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 good. What does Jira mean, Nick? And I was shocked to come upon this understanding. I'm like, provide, bless you, be really nice to you, you know, fill your barns to overflowing, prosperity. And I found something very different. Jira, you can go and you can research all about it. It has a lot to do with seeing and watching. Someone say to see. To see. Well, Nick, how does that, no, 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 please go back. How does that, how does that uh, mean provide, Nick? How does that, how does that get there? To see. And then what he does is when he sees you, when he sees you, when he sees me, when he watches you, he starts to gain understanding of you. He starts to know more of who you are. And then after that, once he knows more of who you are, then he can look after you. Again, someone say, look after Look after you. This, this word has a ton to do with seeing you. So I was praying about this, and anytime I can, I will always talk about my Bible girl, okay? Anytime I can, I will talk about my little girl, Kennedy. She's coming up on two this week, church. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, next week. That's what I'm saying, this week. May 16th. I know the date. I forget dates, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. May 16th. I'm excited. I'm going to have a, a beautiful little two-year-old, uh, two going on 15 with all the sass in the room. My gosh. Um, any chance I get to talk about her, I'll talk about her. And I learned, uh, upon reading this, I the only thing I could think of are my kids. So when you have a one-year-old, a two-year-old, you spend and your whole life revolves around them. By the way, they didn't tell you. Uh, if, you are, if you are thinking about having a kid, be ready to lose all of your life. It's the best thing ever, okay? 
you sacrifice it all, your life is no longer your own. Literally the one day we had the kids, uh, someone came to watch the kiddos, and we were like, babe, do you just want to sit and have a nice dinner and watch TV? We were like, yes. I don't even do that. And so I was thinking about my, my two-year-old. And she is, she is learning to talk, but the beautiful thing is, is as I watch her and as I gain understanding, I am better able to look after. So she walks around with all their sass, and I'm like, oh, you want some orange juice? Oh, okay, you want your toy, your little princess toy. We don't know what she's saying, but because I've seen her and I've gained understanding of her, even in the midst of whatever she's saying, I know how to look after her. Not only that, when, uh, when you have kids, oh my gosh, she is mastering the fake cry. So like, oh, it's so funny. Oh, it's so funny, the fake cry. Ooh, stop it, you're faking me. But even when you watch your kids, you can tell what's real. You can tell where they're at. There's the sleepy cry where it doesn't make sense and you're crying and I don't understand. There's the cry where you just want my attention and then I go and tickle her belly and she's like laugh crying. Have you ever seen that? Laugh crying. I know where you're at. Then there's the times where, like, she's really hurt, and that's where you don't hear a thing for four seconds. And you're like, oh, my gosh, we have a big problem here. You get to see, and you understand. And so then what I can learn or, or from my seeing and from my understanding, I learn how to look after her. I can help her. I can give her what she needs. I can tell her, honey, you need a nap. I can tell you're hungry. You don't want this toast? Cool. And so I get to learn how to look after her. Is this making sense, church? So Jaira has a lot to do with seeing and how beautiful it is that God sees you. Isn't that crazy, church? That out of his magnificence and all the people in the world, all the wonderful, beautiful people in the world, he has the capacity to look and watch you, Jason. He has the capacity to look at and see you, Harley. He can see us. And so I wanted to share some scripture on what it is to see, to see us, to see us. You can put this up here. Psalm 33 puts it like this. From heaven, the Lord, Jireh, he looks down and sees all mankind. There's that word. You wouldn't see, like, again, the way that we read the Bible, we wouldn't understand that. But this is where Jireh comes in. The Lord looks down. He's watching over all mankind. God looks down from heaven on all mankind to see, someone say to see, to see if there are any who understand and any who seek. So he's watching us. He's observing us. Though the Lord is exalted, this is, again, this is crazy. He looks kindly on the lowly. That is you and me. Though lofty, he sees from afar. Just like I see my daughter. And I watch her play, and I watch her grow up, and I watch her discover things. And the other day she was coloring and got pen all over her. Don't know why. But I just see. I watch. God gains understanding on you. Even though he knows all about you already, there's a beautiful thing that he does. He wants to learn who you are and knows who you are. You have searched me, O Lord. It says in Psalm 139. You have searched me. That is to see and to gain understanding in your heart. You know me. You've learned me. You know when I sit down. You know when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. Oh, that's pretty scary. Ain't no hiding. He knows your thoughts, church. He sees them. You discern my going out. And my lying down. You're familiar with all of my ways. In other words, like I said, he gains understanding. I know Kiki's fake cry. I know when she's happy. I know what's going to make her giggle. I know when she's tired. I've learned all of her ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know, you, Lord, know it completely. You know what I do for Kiki? Because this girl can eat. This girl can eat. You know what I do? I put her to bed. I know her. I know her. She goes to sleep around 10, 45, 11 for her nap. And she's going to wake up at 1.30. But she's going to be hangry, hangry. So you know what I do for the girl? I prep her food so that queen, when she gets right out of bed, she plops in her chair and has her toshed. All right? 
called Toshed. <laughs> That's what I do, continental breakfast. That's what I make for her. I get food ready for her because I know she's going to be crazy. I've learned her ways. I'm familiar with what she does. And then finally to look after. I love this. You can go ahead and put this up here. To look after. Blessed is the one. Blessed is the one. This is in Psalm 1, the very first one. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the ways, in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. In other words, bless the one who is not with that which is evil. But whose delight is in the law of the Lord. In other words, who is, belongs to Christ, who follows him with their whole heart. And who meditates on him day and night. Meditates on his law day and night. That person, I love this promise. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water. Which yields its fruits in season. And whose leaves never wither. That's what it's like to, to belong to God and be close to God. He sees you. He gains understanding. And then from heaven, when you see water, it, it is heaven's blessing and heaven's life. You see that you are planted by life and you have it 24-7. That water nourishes you in every season. And then a couple verses down in verse 6. six. For the Lord what? Watches. You see that verb, to see. He watches over you. He watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. It doesn't say that he watches the way of the wicked. Actually, he turns his eyes from that and says, good luck figuring it out. Notice that the prodigal son story, the father didn't watch his son go and be debaucherous, but he was looking for when he came back. The eyes, gyra, to see, to gain understanding, and ultimately to provide or watch over. I wanted to write it like this so that we, we can have a better understanding. The Lord will provide. A better way of understanding Jehovah Jireh would be Jehovah will see to it. Jehovah will see to it. He'll see to it that Kiki gets breakfast. He'll see to it that you will have a roof over your head. He'll see to it. He'll see to it that you have everything that you, someone say need, need. He'll see to it. He'll see to it. So what does my life, ultimately, I wanted to ask this question for us all to consider here today. What does my, look, my life look like when he sees to it? Isn't that powerful? Because I want to see to it myself. I feel like in my own power, I can make my own way. But what would your life look like if you trusted the name of Jehovah Jireh and you allowed him to see to it? Right, church? Anyone with me? Allowing him to see and observe and then ultimately to provide or to make a way. Some of us don't like to be seen by God. We put up a big wall. You're missing out on him watching over you when we do that. And so what would your life look like if you allowed him to see to it? You guys can open your Bibles, please. We're going to John chapter 6. John chapter, is it John chapter 6 or am I mad? No, John chapter 6. I messed up my Bible. John chapter 6. John chapter 6. What did what'd you say? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John chapter 6. Mm -mm -mm. Jesus feeds the 5,000. I want you to understand that we witness Jehovah Jireh provide for the masses in a miraculous way. This is what happens when you allow him to see to it. This is what happens when you allow him to see, observe, and make a way for you. Amen, church? And so I want to I want to focus on this story. This is going to be a beautiful. This is uh, John chapter 6, verse 1. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee. That is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs that he had performed by healing the sick. You know what's really cool? You know what's really cool? Is that we, God is not just hidden, we actually have an opportunity to see and gain understanding of him too. Isn't that beautiful? That he makes himself known to us. We can see him move. We can gain understanding as well to who he is as our Lord and Savior. So they saw miraculous signs. They were like, I want to be around that guy. The words that he's speaking are true. I need that in my life. He offers forgiveness for someone like me. I'm going to chase him with my whole heart. 
we see him and gain understanding. He makes himself known to us, and we hunger after him. And so then Jesus, he went up on a mountainside and sat down with the disciples. The Jewish uh, Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up, someone say looked up. He saw. He physically saw. He looked at the masses. He saw what was going on. There was 5,000 men plus probably 5,000 women and, and, and a ton of children. A ton of children. And so Jesus saw. He looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him. And he said, Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? You know what? He was traveling and journeying and preaching and teaching. And it was all day. And he was like, man, these people are hungry. He saw them and he gained understanding of them. He asked, I love this. This is so interesting. And, and a lot of us might have a hard time with this. But he asked only to test him for he already had in mind what he was going to do. He wanted to see if the disciples had knowledge or trust in the name of Jehovah Jireh. He wanted to see what their response would be if they had enough faith, trust, to know that Jesus would provide. Even in an insurmountable situation, an incomprehensible situation, Jesus, how are you going to feed 5,000 people? I have a hard time feeding my family of four. So he looked up, and he saw the people, and I, I wanted to share this as well. You'll see, you'll see Christ operate in the scriptures. Miracles often happen. They begin with him seeing and taking note of someone. Look at the story of the gate called Beautiful. John and Peter, they were walking through their normal day, and they saw the man. And said, whoa, we need to do something about this. The casting out of demons, Philip saw saw the person and cast a demon out of the fortune teller. Miracles often begin with see and then to gain understanding. So displays of miracles often begin with Jesus seeing people. The story goes on. You can keep going. Philip answered him, I would take, I would take more than half a year, or it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. That's how many people are here. You couldn't make this happen. There's no way. Philip had a limited ability to see what is not already there. He had an inability to see what was not already there. But he did make a logical observation. Sometimes we do that. There's no way this could happen. There's no way this could happen. I'm trying to raise money for a mission trip. There's no way. There's no way God's going to provide come through. I only got 200 bucks. I need to save $2,000 to go to Africa. How is this going to happen? No way. We want to buy a house and start a family. No way with the situation that we're in. No way. No way. No way. How are we going to do this? Philip had a limited ability to see what is not already there. He made a logical observation. Another, someone else answered, go ahead. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small loaves of bread and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? He said, well, here's what we got then. We can see these, these, these bread, this bread and this fish. Here's what we got. Let's see what you do with it, Jesus. At least he was like, go ahead, you take over. I was uh, sharing with Emmy because she, she was talking with church girls. Hey, what's up, ladies? How y'all doing? Um, and, and we were talking about this message, and it's crazy that this, we, we both were touching on it this week. But I think sometimes, sometimes church, and we're, we're, we're guilty of this. We want to see the baskets before we begin to break the bread. We want to see the provision. We want to see, we want to see the end result before we take the step. And sometimes we need the end result. We need to see the end result before we trust. That's the wrong equation. We need to trust before we see the end result. What did it say in Psalm chapter 9? Those who trust in, or those who know my name will trust me. Did the disciples know who they were talking to? Jesus is the I am. He is Jehovah Jireh. Did they know who they were talking to? I have some, some fish and some bread. 
We want to see the baskets. All he wants to see is the trust. I can do it. I can do it, he says. I can do it. Jesus said, have the people, have them sit down. He did enough observing. Okay, let's gain some understanding. Let's see and let's witness our disciples here. I asked a question. I already knew what I was going to do. Now I observed and gained understanding of our people, everyone on the mountain. Here we go. Have everyone sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves. He broke them and gave thanks. Church, we're called to give thanks in all circumstances. Amen, church. He gave thanks. Jesus gave thanks and distributed to those who were seated as much. Someone say as much. As much as they wanted. Philip said, oh, hopefully they get a bite. No, that means that they were like, Thanksgiving dinner, oh, I'm stuffed full. As much as they wanted. As much as they wanted. And he did the same with the fish. Not as much as they needed, as much as they wanted. That's how much God can provide. They witness a miracle of provision, church. They witness what God does or what God means when he says, I am Jehovah Jireh, I will provide for you. And that's what's even crazier is it's not even just in the individual circumstance. He provided for the community. Everyone ate. I always say, everybody eats. Everybody eats. Everybody eats. If only we could trust. You know what I mean? We worry about what tomorrow brings. We worry about what clothes to wear, what we need to eat. God says, look at the sparrows, look at the lilies. I clothe all of them. I give them everything that they need. I take care of them. And yet, how much more valuable are you than they? I will take care of you. We spend so much time worrying. So much time full of anxiety and stress. So much time trying to take control and make our own way. And God's like, I see you. I know what you need. Will you let me in and take care of it? I will look after you. Warren, it's really funny. And I'm, I'm glad that he's doing this. But Warren has been going through this phase of, I want to make my own food. Oh, does he destroy our whole kitchen? It's like, bro. Just let me do it. And he doesn't understand. If you would let me provide for you, I'll give it right now. Here we go. And I love that he's taking his time and making his peanut butter and jelly for 28 and a half minutes. He's learning. But he doesn't understand. If you would just let your father do it. Take your hands off. Let him go. God will give you everything you need. Always. Someone say always. This is an incredible miracle. A true display of Jehovah Jireh. When they all had enough to eat. When they all had enough to eat. Imagine the one dude was like, yeah, I'll take more bread. Yeah, I'll take more bread. Yeah, I'll take more. Imagine being that guy. I would eat all of it. He said to his disciple, I don't get, I don't get much bread anymore. Gluten-free life. Mm. GF and DF. Gluten-free, dairy-free. You know what I mean? We have a text message with the guys. They made fun of me. What, girl food? Yeah. GF and DF. Gather the pieces that are left over. So not only, not only did everyone have their fill, but look, there's stuff left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the bread loaves left over from those who had eaten. Only Christ can break bread and fill baskets, church. Only Christ can break bread and fill baskets. Church, I feel like I'm preaching today. Like, what's up? Only Christ can break bread and fill baskets. How much effort are you putting into your own life to try filling that basket? Just let this dude do it. He sees it all. He knows how to watch over you. He's gained understanding, and he wants to make a way and provide. Let this dude break bread and fill your basket. After the people saw the sign, this is what's awesome. Uh, Jesus performed. They began to say, surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. So they saw, they saw that Jesus was who Jesus is. They were like, whoa. This is the God that is promised to us, the Savior of the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, imagine that. Like attacking him, you're king. He withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Mm. Mm. He's all we need. They recognized it right then and there. If he can provide and perform the miraculous like that, 
He really is all we need. Sometimes, church, I get, I don't want to say I get disappointed, but I wish we didn't need to see the miracle in order to trust. Blessed are those who haven't seen and yet believe. Can we learn from this story, read it, and, and place our trust in him? Christ saw the crowd. To wrap up the story, he saw the crowd, he understood that they were hungry, and provided for their need. He is Jehovah Jireh. That's what this story is all about. He is Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. The God will provide. The Lord will provide. That is what Jehovah Jireh is. He sees, knows you, and gives you everything that you need. And so I've been talking about that word trust. And some of us might have some trust issues. We might love control. Maybe we haven't seen God move in, in ways that we've needed him to. And just so you know, provision comes in, in so many different forms. Yeah, we could talk about finances. But a provider of peace, friendships, and, and, and solid, healthy relationships, he can give you whatever you need. So I want to ask, uh, I, I want to offer up some, some ideas. Maybe we will find greater trust in Jehovah Jireh if we do these several things. Maybe if we put our trust, we put our faith on the line and say, even though I don't feel it, I'm going to choose to trust and watch you. I got it. Your word says that you're going to provide, so I'm just going to trust. We will find greater trust in him if we do these five things. First of all is seek him. The word seek actually is to see as well. Like I said earlier, he is a God who has made himself known and available to us. We can see him, and therefore we can chase after him. You will not find trust if you're not chasing after him. To, uh, and I, I don't often like to come at the church oftentimes, but man, <laughs> uh, we, expect, we expect God to show up and do X, Y, and Z things, but in the relationship category, our effort is 0% at times. And we want him to do the miraculous. We want to be close to him. We want to see him move, and yet we don't read. We don't pray. We're lucky to get here once a month around community. The last time we talked about Bible things was, I don't know, January maybe. Like seriously, seek after him. And you will find greater trust in Jehovah Jireh. Just so you know, like the things that we do, the extracurricular things, the date nights, the church girls, the, the circles, we're not doing those for numbers. We're doing that so that we can seek him and chase after him with everything we've got. Can I tell you that for date night, we have date night coming up on Friday. Yeah, I know. Um, the marriages that were hurting and have been at every one of those have been totally restored. Like, I, like all of them. And to know, like, no glory of Emmy or I. No, 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 no. That's just seeking him and he restores. Like, he does some work. So these opportunities are for you to grow and seek him. It's not a numbers thing. It's not a we want to be dope thing and post a cool picture on Instagram. That's not what it's about. It's about seeking him. Amen, church? My feet have followed in his tracks, it says in Job. <laughs> and if you know anything about the story of Job... Wow, lost everything. And look at what he says, his perspective on seeking God. My feet have followed in his tracks. I have kept his way without turning aside. Oh, if I could get to the end of my days saying that. Oh, I love that. I have not departed from the command of his lips. How do you know his command if you haven't read it? I have treasured, this is what I pray for all of us in this room. I pray that you would treasure the words of his mouth more than your daily bread. We just talked about bread. This is what will truly nourish you. So for you, I pray that you would value and treasure his words more than anything you could need in this world. We've been taught in school the, the what is it, Maslow's hierarchy of need. They're forgetting one thing. Jesus at the top. Water, shelter, food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus at the top. 
So you have to seek him. You will find greater trust in him if you seek him. Read the word. When you read the word, you're like, whoa, this is what God does. This is who he is. Yeah, I trust him. Secondly is this. Live content. Live content. That's a very foreign thing for us Americans. And I'm all about ambition. And I'm all about growing. And I'm all about chasing your dreams. That's why I love this country. Anyone else with me? Come on now. I love this country. God bless America. Yeah. But we have, a, we have a contentedness problem. We buy cars that we should not buy. We buy homes that we should not buy. This is me preaching to me. We go out to dinner far more than we ought, and we flex our dinner muscles. Yeah. We spend all this money, and we mismanage our budget. Do you know that finances can make you a slave? And when you're in debt, it says that you're a slave to the debtor. And if we only gathered this live contentness, if we understood what it is to be content. And church, when I preach, I'm not just preaching, I'm talking to Nick Miller right now. Because I'm the guy who like, oh, I could just make fun of myself. I'm not going to do it. Live content. Live content. I built a garden box and went to the nines. Like I can't even do like a garden box halfway. I go all the way. Content is not in my nature. <sighs> but look at what Paul says. I love this. Philippians 4. Oh, we, we do, um, this is one of those scriptures where everyone has it on their wall. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This actually comes from a place of contentment. That he is the strength. He is the one who provides. He's the one who makes a way. He is your strength, not the effort, not the money. And so the Philippian church is giving to Paul, and they're providing for him, and he's incredibly grateful. But he says these powerful words, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. They're helping him with his ministry. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am seek or speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to what? Be content. I am to be content. I know, look at this, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. To live content knowing that in every season he's going to give you everything that you need to be who you are, who you're called to be. That's striving. That going for it outside of our means, it kills us. It kills us. So church, we have to live content. I'm preaching to myself. I have my whole house drawn up. I'm that type of person. I'm going to build a house one day. But we're in a season right now. i got to be content with that. I'm honored to be in the house that we're in. I love my home. But we definitely need to practice being content. Number three is this, express gratitude. Church, we don't do this enough. In fact, I feel like oh, all across, we just take things for granted. We take things for granted. We take those closest to us for granted. We take the external things for granted. We take our job for granted. Sometimes we take our children for granted. Like, we have so much to be thankful for. Church, am I the only one? I mean, I could sit here, if I actually if I actually shift my mind, I could sit here and tell you for nine and a half hours all the things that I should be thankful for. First of all, starting with the fact that I have breath in my lungs and I'm here with you. I mean, we could be expressing gratitude always. Once you start expressing gratitude, all of that, like, um, yucky desire, that, that selfish desire, that all starts fading away. And we start seeing what he truly does for us and provides in ways that we need. We take our eyes off of ourselves and onto him. Rejoice always, church. 
Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This is the whole scripture for the year. We're in the year of constant prayer. This is what we do. This is not a, this is not a, oh, you know, I think every once in a while you should be grateful. No, no, no. This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus, that you should be expressing and giving thanks in all circumstances. We have a trust problem because we don't give thanks. We don't acknowledge what he's done. We take for granted his works. I know you have plans for building your house and doing X, Y, and Z, but my gosh, you have a roof with a wonderful family. Love it. I know a job might be complicated, but you at least have a, a, a means of providing for your family. And I'll also say that if you're struggling with your job, start giving thanks for it, and you'll see your job start to shift. I promise you. I promise you. Number four is this. Sometimes, sometimes we lack trust because we don't actually ask. Emmy just said it today. Church, you got to speak up. you got to say things out loud. When we get in praise and worship, there's a lot of... And when we get in prayer, there's a lot of... Like, talk to God. Seriously. He's available. He wants to know you and talk with you and speak with you. And, and of course, he knows your minds. I'm not saying that he can't read your thoughts. But I think that there's something powerful. And correct me if I'm wrong. There's something powerful in our words. Amen, church? And I know I'm not wrong because the Bible says that there is life and death in the power of the tongue. That it does move things. And sometimes, sometimes we lack trust or sometimes we're missing this trust because we simply do not ask. God, you're falling through. I'm disappointed. Where are you at? Well, did you ask him what you need? Did you ask him what's on your heart? Did you pray about some things? There's a, there's a, a person in church who uh, has had to move and has had to shift around. And right now they're living with uh, grandma and grandpa. That would be an interesting one. Woo. But you know what she did in small group this past week? She said, I, I'm asking God for a favorable transaction and a favorable purchase on a house. The market's crazy. I want to see him move. How would God know that if she didn't ask it in the first place? And then not only that, but the whole community around her says, yeah, we're going to lift that up in prayer right now. And we're going to contend with you and we're going to pray with you and we're going to walk through this with you. And all of a sudden, everyone has their eyes on it. And then someone sees a house that's like a gem. And we point her to that house. But how can we move and how can we operate without asking and expressing what's going on in here? God, I know that the market's crazy and this house should be, you know, 180, but right now it's 424. Give me some blessing and favor on this. There's nothing wrong with actually asking. We have a good father, you know that? When we ask for bread, he doesn't give us rocks, just so you know. He wants to meet your needs. And I believe, again, with her circumstance, wanting to raise her family and be the strong woman that she's called to be and build a greater relationship with her husband, I'm telling you, that house, I think God wants to move, amen? So we go and ask. This is the confidence that we have in approaching God. That if we ask, someone say, ask anything. Ask anything according to his will. <laughs> so Nick Miller, until he's blue in the face, could ask, I need a billion dollars. It ain't going to happen, bro. According to his will. You think God wants to give her a wonderful home to raise her family and grow closer to her husband? Of course do you think that God wants to see you have peace in your life? Yeah, he's going to give you peace. When you ask for wisdom, he's going to graciously and generously give you wisdom. Church, we don't do enough asking. And I don't know if it's because we're afraid to be let down. I don't know if it's, well, I would say it's probably because we have a lack of trust. We don't want to put ourselves out there. Church, we have to actually ask. And then we trust. God, I need bread. Can you help me? Yep, let's trust. Bread might not come in one minute, by the way. It might take some time. 
And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of him. So long as it is according to his will. Church, we need to practice asking. Someone say, speak up. We need to speak up more. If you're praying and you're being quiet, I know it might be intimidating. I know it might be unfamiliar and uncomfortable to open your mouth, but open your mouth and start speaking. If you're singing, I don't care. That's why we play the music loud. You can go ahead and sing away and be terrible all you want. Go for it. It's okay. Start speaking to him. Start singing. Start praying. Start asking. Start being vocal about this. And lastly, I want to say this, is give constantly. If you're having a, oh, this is crazy. If you're having a trust problem in Jehovah Jireh, I want to encourage you, take him at his word and watch the overflow of blessing that comes when you simply just trust. It makes no sense. I don't understand the equation, but my Bible, the Bible that I read, the Bible that is true and unfailing, says that he will, he will bless you as you give to him. He will take care of you. And the church has a giving problem. And I don't want you to give because the church needs money. Church, we're fine. God has provided for us too. Like he provides for the community. But some of us are missing that trust facet of what it means to walk with Jehovah Jireh. And you're missing out on the blessing that God promises for your life because you won't give constantly. Wait, someone say constantly. I'm not talking about after this message, going to the back and giving one time. I'm talking about consistent trust in Him. I'm talking about steadfast trust in Jehovah Jireh. I'm talking about the intentionality behind saying, God, have my finances. And when you start operating like that and He starts blessing you, you're going to be like, whoa, He really is Jehovah Jireh. He really does take care of us. Emily and I have given more this year than in our entire life. By the way, I would never ask you to do something that we're not already doing. Serious. And we've just seen so much blessing and provision, promotion, just even care. We're at a place now where, yeah, we think about finances, but God has provided for all of our needs. We're okay. We're not a slave to the money. God has been so good to us. We give constantly. When we go and we see other pastors, we give to churches. Even though it's not our own church, so what? We go and we prepare to give constantly. Hmm. We need to practice this, church, and you'll find trust. Watch what he says. Remember this. This is in uh, in 2 Corinthians. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. That is a truth. That is from the word of God. You want to see God show up, whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. That's what I'm talking about today. Don't just give the one time bang. That's, I'm talking like get get in prayer about this and really consider and really decide in your heart that you're going to trust them with everything you have. I'm talking everything, not just like your awesome time and, you know, fun, good feelings. I'm talking about trusting them with the things that hurt too. Not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. Today, if it's like, oh, Nick's talking about this giving message again, and you're not cheerful about it, please don't give. It's okay. But look at what the scripture keeps on saying. And God will, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Why does he want to bless you? So that you can go be a blessing to the rest of the world. There's people that need fed, and he's going to bless you so that you can go and reach people. There are people whose homes need rebuilt. You can go down to Appalachia in West Virginia and see people who really have no money. There's people sitting there with mold in their house, holes in their roof. They have barely anything working in their home, and they're still sitting there after a flood 10, 15 years ago. They have nothing. Their economy was abolished, destroyed by this flood. Go see what it's like to really have some need. Let's go make a difference. He's going to bless you so that you can go make a difference. So that you can go make a difference. He will give you everything that you need so that you may abound in every good work. My goodness, the thing that was like on my heart. Why was this on my heart? 
What show was I watching? Oh, I was watching The Queen's Gambit. Because <laughs> I, love, I love chess, and I was like, oh, I just want to watch it again. And the girl was an orphan. Uh, it's just on my heart, like I was just talking with Emmy, like even just adoption. I don't know what that looks like, but God has given us everything that we need so that we can care for the young children in this world. This is like kind of a hot topic, but so many people make a decision to end their child's life in the womb because their finances are tight. And imagine if the church stepped up and said, we will help you on this journey, even financially. Don't make that decision. Don't make that decision. What would it look like if we put our money where our mouth is? We love everyone. Good. Well, let's go take care of that person. Maybe that beautiful life wouldn't be ended. Hmm. So that we could abound in every good work. That's why he does this. No government is going to solve the problem. It is going to be the church it's going to be Jesus Christ who ultimately solves the problem. Amen, church? And I want it no other way. I want it no other way. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. The scripture keeps on going. Go ahead. Now he who supplies the seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the har harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. Does anyone want to live like that? I want to live like that. But you got to trust and that comes through sowing. That comes through sowing. You'll be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving. In other words, when they were talking about thank you for pouring into us, uh, the, the church, what's going to happen is it's going to change lives. It's going to result in thanksgiving. It's going to bring about eternity on earth. Amen, church? Does anyone want to be a part of that? So if you're having trust issues with Jehovah Jireh, Rebecca, can we go over these five things again? Someone say, seek him. Seek him. You got to go after him. Chase him with everything you got. And as you discover more of his nature, you're going to trust him. Second one is this. Go ahead, put this up there. Live content. Know what it is. Know what it is to be content and to just, again, enjoy all that he has for you. Go ahead. Express gratitude. We don't do this enough. Be thankful in all circumstances. Go ahead. Next one. Actually ask Lift it up. Lift up the question. God, I need you to move in this way. Can you give me this bread? Go ahead. Last one. Give constantly. Someone say, Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will see to it. The Lord will see to it. I pray that you would put your trust in Jehovah Jireh today. That he would see to, take care of, gain understanding, and watch over you for the rest of your days. Psalm chapter 9 says, as you get to know his name, you trust him more and more. Isn't that powerful, church? Is anyone encouraged by learning what Jireh means today? I feel that as we learn this, we can trust more and more in him. Church, let's pray. God, thank you for an incredible day that we get to learn about your name and discover more of who you are. Thank you that you are Jehovah Jireh, that you see me. You're not some far away, don't care about me type of God. You're a God who sees and looks at me. You search my heart and know who I am in and out of every season. You know when I get up, you know when I lie down, you know what my thoughts are, you know the words that I'm about to speak. You have gained understanding and ultimately God, thank you that you are looking after me. Thank you that you're looking after me. I pray that I would trust you as my provider, the one who sees, understands, and watches over. God, I'm excited for the miracles that are going to happen in this room as we trust you as provider. I'm excited to see these miracles of provision go on in our life, that you're going to show up and do possible and incredible things in circumstances that might look on the outside looking in like they're never going to happen. Thank you that you are Jehovah Jireh. If there's anyone in this place who has not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, he is Jehovah Jireh as well. And this journey, this journey with him, this journey of trust, this journey of provision, healing, this journey of, of, of um, what did we talk about last week, honey? What's on my mind? Why can't I think of it? Shalom, this journey of peace. The peace that we're so desperately need. If you want to begin this journey, I'm telling you, Jesus made the way. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have it all together. 
He wants to show up in your life and move in your life, but we have to let him. And the beautiful thing is, is that you don't have to be perfect for him to come in and start moving and changing things. Jesus took all of the iniquity, all of man's sin on his shoulders and said, I'm going to rescue you. I'm going to heal you. I'm going to save you. And the way he did it was to put all the sin on his shoulder, die and rise again, claiming and finally uh, winning over the power of death. So that you may be set free and you may be able to walk in the life, the abundant life that he has promised for you. Jesus says, I've come that you may have life and life to the full. And all you simply have to do is believe, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that he is Lord and Savior and you will be saved. And this journey, this journey with him will begin. This journey with Jehovah Jireh will begin. Does anyone want to give their life to Jesus this morning? On the count of three, if that's you and you want to declare him as your Lord and Savior, begin this journey with him. Believe in your heart and claim him as Lord and Savior. If that's you, on the count of three, I just want you to raise your hand. Believers are praying for you, so don't be ashamed. Don't be embarrassed. This is for you and you alone. If you want to begin that journey with him, on the count of three, go ahead and raise your hand as an outward way of saying, I need him. One, two, three. Anyone want to make that decision today? Anyone want to give their life to Jesus? Hmm. Declare him as Lord and Savior. That's awesome. If you made that decision in your heart, just pray this out loud and, and, and pray this with me. Jesus, I give you my life. I believe that you died and rose again thousands of years ago to set me free for not just on this earth but forevermore. God, you are my Lord and Savior. I turn from my past and I walk into the future that you have created for me. I embrace you as my Lord and Savior. I submit everything to you. You have my life. In Jesus' name, everybody said... Amen. Can we lift up a shout of praise for those who made that decision? Yeah. Hey, uh, church, will you all stand with us and worship the name that is powerful? Come on. Come on.